All right, thanks again for coming. Um, just also like to start off by saying thank you to the Winkler and District Chamber of Commerce, Tanya, for uh, allowing us to partner with them to put this on as a free informational session on uh, everybody's favorite topic these days, ransomware. Uh, my name is Dave Giesbrecht. I am with Solutions IT here in Winkler and uh, would also like to uh, introduce not only myself, but uh, you can probably figure out who we are by our pictures. Uh, Kenton Dirksen from Gizlis and Targonic Peters, as well as Kurt Duick uh, with Solutions IT. And also uh, videoing for posterity's sake is Wes Entz, who just joined us at Solutions IT a few days ago. So uh, again, thanks for coming. And uh, we are going to uh, just jump right in. The word ransomware is a combination of ransom and software and refers to any kind of malware that demands a ransom from a user in exchange for the return of a kidnapped file. Kidnapped? Ransom? Is this for real? Yes, basically, this threat works just like a kidnapping in real life, except the things held captive are your files, which may be multimedia files, office files, or system files that your computer relies on to work properly. How is it spread? Typical methods are through attachments sent via unsolicited emails, or by clicking on a link in an email that claims to be from a bank or delivery company. They are also distributed through peer-to-peer -peer file sharing networks, being passed on through activation keys for popular software, like Adobe Photoshop and Microsoft Office. What kinds are there? There are two kinds. The first is called a file coder, which encrypts the files. And the second is a lock screen, which locks the computer and stops you using it until you have paid the ransom. This type of threat sometimes employs psychological methods to trick you and pressurize you into paying. In some cases, the lock screen also incorporates a live transmission of what the webcam is currently seeing, which creates a feeling that someone really is watching you. Other times, the message on the lock screen takes the form of a notice from a national police force which states that the authorities require you to pay a fine because they have found evidence that your computer contains images of child abuse or bestiality or that you have visited illegal websites or used pirated software. The next thing we'll talk about, I want to talk about is no one's too small. So in a lot of previous rants, like viruses or anything else, it was, you could hide in obscurity by being one or two people. But unfortunately, right now, with the way that this, these attacks are being distributed, the attackers that are happy to hit singles every day. They'll, they'll send it to grandma, and they'll send it to large organizations, multinationals. Realistically, most of the, because it's mostly spam, they'll send it, they send it to legitimately everywhere. And it's, I kind of dropped the, the visual just to give you an idea of, like, it, it's random because everything's pretty much split. Um, ransomware is absolutely becoming more common. They're, and like when they're, so when they're talking about 93% of phishing emails, so 93% of the phishing emails that are going out are delivering some sort of ransomware. So they're not just selling Viagra or you know, something else. They're, they're trying to steal money. Uh, and ransomware is big business. This is, uh, I've had this conversation with, with several, several people as well that these guys are, like this is related to organized crime worldwide and they're not thugs sitting on an alley corner uh, talking about how they're gonna you know, steal things from your car. They're, they resemble business. They're guys sitting around a boardroom trying to figure out how they can extract another you know, $6 million from worldwide to fund uh, drug trafficking or something else, some other part of their business. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dave, who's going to talk a little bit about impact. There you go. Thank you. Who doesn't love their morning coffee? I actually wasn't a coffee drinker until about six or eight months ago. I uh, finally decided to take the plunge, and I've been hooked ever since, unfortunately. But um, 
one incident that I would like to uh, talk about. First of all, uh, it, it's pretty obvious. Ransomware is affecting everybody. Big business, small business, people with their family photos can be held hostage. So one very recent incident that hit home for me was when I was trying to get my coffee. Uh, I walked into coffee establishment, Tim Hortons, here in town. This is about a few weeks ago, three or four weeks ago. And uh, I noticed the lineup was pretty long inside, but, uh, you know, whatever. There, it usually doesn't take that long. It's probably just a busy day. So I walked in, got in line. And after about 20 minutes, I've moved about this far. And I said, something is wrong here. I noticed that there was only one till open and it was taking them a long time to serve each person. I thought, hmm, wonder what's going on. Maybe it's, maybe they're having like a personnel issue or something like that. I found out afterwards that Tim Hortons themselves had been hit with a malware attack. It was affecting all of their stores countrywide and some of them had to shut down completely, some were limping along. It hit their point of sale system so you couldn't walk in and buy your coffee. That's a big problem when that is what you do for a living. Um, here's a, a short uh, video on that. Now let's check in on the top business story of the day. Tim Hortons has been hit with a reported malware attack knocking out some cash registers. BNN's Paige Jealous joins me now. What's going on? Can you imagine the frustration trying to get your jolt of caffeine in the morning and being told you can't pay yeah. for your coffee? A lot of frustrated customers. According to the Globe and Mail, hundreds of locations across Canada have been affected by this. There was a malware virus that infected the point of sale system for mm -hmm. Tim Hortons. In some cases, stores had to completely close, wow. according to the Globe and Mail, as a result of this. And, and it's really inflaming tensions that were already in place between yeah. Tim Hortons and his parent company. Well, and then that's what I was going to ask as well, because A, there's reputational damage that Tim Hortons, I'm wondering whether they can, they can deal with at this point, mm -hmm. given what a bad few months they've had. And two, they're, they're, I'm wondering whether this causes friction between the franchisees and Tim Hortons itself. It does. In fact, the, the organization that represents disgruntled franchisees sent a letter to the parent company saying, we need compensation. Our franchisees have lost sales. As a result of this, there's brand damage. There's products that are spoiling because we can't sell them. Uh, so, so I think that is a, a very relevant point. I'd also note that I, I think it's the roll up the rim promotion That's right now. Right. So bad timing from a promotional and PR perspective. Everyone's talking about roll up the rim and some people can't buy their coffees. That's bad, right? <laughs> That's bad. Uh, so as you can see, and they hit on a few points in that. Ransomware impacts all aspects of your business. So it impacts your sales. Uh, you can't move product. You can't even manufacture product. Uh, you can't sell your services. It could also impact your reputation. Somebody says, well, I, I tried to do business with you, but I, I, I'm not sure I want to anymore because of this. This, this happened. Um, it can affect trust in your company. It can impact your brand confidence. Uh, so, like, like I mentioned, and like they mentioned in that, uh, in that short news article. And, of course, it can open the door for your competitors because if you can't do what your business is, somebody else is always sitting there waiting to take that business away from you. So as you can see, there's uh, a ransomware attack has a very real cost to your business. Uh, you may have to close your doors while you deal with it. That's, you're not making money if your doors are closed. Uh, plus the cost of fixing the damage while you're recovering from whatever happened. To speak a little bit more to the real cost uh, to your business, I'd like to call up Mr. Kenton Dirksen, partner at GTP, and uh, then I'll wrap that part up and then hand it back off to Kurt. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here to, to chat with you. Uh, it was nice to sneak out of the office. I'm an <laughs> accountant in tax season, and uh, I think I left the office yesterday at uh, just before 3, so uh, yeah, my apologies if I look a little tired. Um, yeah, so talking about the real cost of business, I want to tell you a story about uh, something that we did uh, when I was in grade 11. Um, when I was in grade 11, we sold egging insurance uh, at Halloween <laughs> to all the businesses <laughs> in Gimli, and uh, they didn't do that for two years in a row because it basically turned into extortion. Uh, somehow the, uh, <laughs> the only businesses to get egged uh, were the ones that hadn't paid. Um, <laughs> But at least we didn't have to clean up a lot of businesses that did buy the insurance, so it was good. 
But uh, no, um, it seems people always find ways to make a dollar. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of people that are finding some very poor ways to make money off of, uh, off of people that are quite, uh, quite innocently clicking on things. And uh, I, I was expecting a package from UPS. I clicked on the link. And in the meantime, you've picked up something. Uh, so what are the costs that we're looking at here? I, I think we can boil it down to four things. We're paying for the downtime. We're paying for the fix. We're paying for the ransom. And we're paying for the prevention. Uh, when we're looking at downtime, Dave already addressed this. What is the cost of a day of downtime in your business? Uh, what about a week of downtime? It can take quite a while to recover from these. What if you can't recover at all? Uh, what if the, the files that have been, been encrypted are ones that you literally do not have a backup of? Uh, wages, uh, you're probably busy paying your employees wages while you're down. Yet, you're really not turning that into any economic good. Uh, so you really ha just have a complete uh, cost sink there. You're losing sales, you're losing reputation, you're losing your data. So what's the fix? There's a cost there too. Uh, In-house IT resources, some of us have people that handle these things in-house. Some of us uh, contact our uh, friendly IT providers. There's a cost that the ransomware people are putting on to us as business people, even if you're paying for in-house people, right? Uh, Randy here uh, works hard at the credit union to keep all their money safe. Uh, but how large is his department? Because people are trying to actively get his money when really there should be just a cost of, of him you know, putting computers up and, and keeping them serviceable. Right now there's a cost of, it's a cold war basically between, between business and between uh, these people. Uh, cost of out of house resources, uh, obviously you're paying people probably at, at inopportune times, you're paying them to work through the night uh, in order to hopefully get you back up. You're also paying the ransom possibly. Uh, what if we have no backups that are recoverable? What if we can't do it? From time to time people do pay the ransom. I know there was a story of a hospital out in London I believe it was, or was it in California? Maybe there's both. Yes. There's both? <laughs> they paid, what was it? high hundreds of thousands, low millions of dollars in order to get their, their data back, right? They, they had no choice and so they paid. These people though are smart because they know grandma's not gonna pay a million dollars to get back pictures of their grandkids, but grandma will pay $500. And that's those singles that Dave was talking about or maybe it was Kurt had mentioned it. Uh, there's an escalating fee structure on these ransoms. You know, on the low end, maybe we're paying a couple of hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin. On the high end, you're paying 150,000, 200,000, 300. These packages are smart. They know what they're encrypting and, and they know how much they've encrypted. They look at the quantity of data. Uh, I'm not sure, maybe they even look at what operating system they're encrypting. If it's a server OS, they maybe right away escalate the, uh, the fee that's, that's coming there. Um, so there's money to be had here if anyone is looking for business opportunity. <laughs> uh, I was looking at online, the Herjavec group, uh, Robert Herjavec came through uh, at a chamber event, what, maybe 10 years ago now? Uh, but he's made his money combating these people. When you see him drive around in his Ferraris and stuff on TV, those are paid for by ransomware. Fighting against Convention. it, though, we should, uh, <laughs> we should make sure to, to highlight, at least we assume. Um, but he, uh, he was saying that in tw the first six, or three months of 2016, $209 million was paid in ransom. Uh, and that's just in the first few months of 2016. So what's the, the cost of prevention though? There's a cost to monitor, right? We're, we're paying, uh, we're outlaying for antivirus software, we're outlaying laying for firewalls and all these kind of pieces. Uh, there's a cost to have backups, right? I'm sure that that'll be in the presentation later is, is the cost of backing up. Cost of training. Training is probably the, the single most important thing is, is teaching your people not to click on things they weren't expecting. And then the cost of your business continuity plan. So all of these different pieces together are the pieces that you need to be, be aware of, be, be weighing, and when you decide how, how important is this matter to me? How important is my data to me? If I'm uh, a one-man show driving a, I don't know, a hi-ho or something, what happens when I lose all my data, all my client contacts, all of my this, that, or the other thing? Can I recreate those things? Now, step it up uh, a level of business. What happens if I'm an accounting office and uh, it is middle of December and one of our new people happened to click on an email and encrypt all of our, our servers? 
uh, am I willing to sit there from Thursday until Sunday morning trying to restore from backups? Uh, as if this sounds autobiographical, it may have happened. Uh, <laughs> these are all critical things to consider. We were able to recover from our situation that we had. Uh, you may not be able to, uh, so it's definitely important to, to be prepared. Anyway, that's all I have to add at this point. And if you have any questions for me, feel free later. Thank you, Kenton. That's, uh, that is exactly the point, the real cost. Um, if this sounds scary, we're not trying to be fear mongers here. It is scary. Uh, we're just trying to present the facts. And then hopefully that information and that education can spur you into uh, taking some action. Um, basically, I want to end off this part before I hand it over to Kurt for uh, some of the technical uh, stuff uh, behind it is um, the criminal may or may not know your company before this happens. Somebody clicks on it, guess what? They're going to know your company after. They have you right where they want you. This is their business. They're criminals, but this is their business. Uh, it's how they make their money. They steal it from you, and they do their homework on you. Uh, and it might not end there. Uh, communicating with them to get your data access back can potentially open your business for more attacks. They may not know much about your business prior to it, but they're going to learn. And uh, one of the most disturbing aspects of this is the fact that they are untraceable. They virtually cannot be caught. So if they hold your information ransom and you pay it, they don't have to follow through on giving you the decryption key because there's no way you can come after them. And unfortunately, that does happen. So the best, uh, as, as we've been saying, the best things to do are prepare yourself, educate yourself. So Kurt, on the education right. front, here we go. Excellent. Well, one of the things on that point is that there is legitimately, yeah, and it would be legitimately uh, ransomware software that doesn't have a key. So that. So you get infected, it looks, it looks exactly like every other variant of ransomware, and it tells you where to send your Bitcoin, and when you do, nothing happens, because the attacker doesn't actually have the decryption key. Your computer just deletes it as soon as it creates it. It's, not, it's, it's done, there is, no, there is no recourse. So these people are not ethical, they're not waiting for you to give them a bad rating on the Business Bureau. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, the, the first piece of sobering information is that there is no magic bullet. There's no, there's no one shot. There's no piece of software or special application or training or something I could sell you. Because if I could sell it to you, I would, but I can't. They're much like preventing your car from being uh, broken into. It is really about prevention. So, and that prevention is done in a layered in a layered approach. This is a really high level way of talking about it. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about is pretty high level. If, you want to talk, if we want to get really specific, we can do that. But I can't do it in, such a, in, in a group like this. Um, layered security sounds like it's complicated, but it really doesn't have to be. Uh, and thinking and not looking at it is something that's pretty prevalent. So one of the, one of the surveys that, that I took that was really sobering for me is that 52% uh, of security professionals, so these are IT people, my, basically my peers, say, they, they said in the survey that they were, I'll, I'll, I'll quote it, at above or average at least when it comes to detecting and blocking ransomware before it encrypts their data. Yet, 36% of them said that they had been victims of ransomware. So, like, the point is that this is ever evolving, and often we don't we we put systems in place and say that, that was good last year, and don't don't look at it going forward. So I'm just going to work my way through these really quickly. Uh, threat protection is the first one. So it's made up of primarily of antivirus. Antivirus programs will protect you from known threats. So that doesn't stop you from zero day, which is unknown threats and it will not protect you from everything. But 
a little bit, an ounce of protection, of prevention will, these are, so if it's known, they'll push the definitions down or the, basically the definitions down and protect you from that. We have spam filters. Spam filters are, well, we, we read before that the primary method of delivery is spam. So stopping these things from hitting your inbox, A, stops the risk. It also has the wonderful unintended consequence of stopping you from looking at 600 emails when only 50 of them are legitimate. Saving a little bit of time in the day. And firewalls. This is a little more on the complicated side. There are two primary firewalls that, we, that I'm going to talk about. You have your workstation firewall. Without it, your computer is essentially listening to everything on the network. So if you are at a hotel with your laptop, uh, and you don't have a firewall and someone else is infected with something and there's a vulnerability, you have, you have an exposure. There's, there's, a, there's an opportunity. And I, I use that example because I, have a, I know of somebody who that exact same thing happened. Went with his family for the weekend, came back with a nice virus on his laptop. And then we have internet firewalls, which would be your router. Most of you will have it if you're sharing. But keeping track of what comes in and out of that network is important. The next layer is application updates. Um, I'm going to tell you, I made this slide, and it still, every time, makes me anxious. Because these are the pop-ups we see, which are terribly annoying. But we have to talk about it, because the vulnerabilities that these patches are solving actually are s protecting you from issues. So a great example is just visiting a website with an unpatched version of Internet Explorer visiting a compromised website with an unpatched version of Explorer specifically, can automatically download, install, and run an application without you doing anything. Just by, you know, you just, you just go to www.virus.com, and it's going to pop up, and you don't notice, but your machine's now been compromised, and the attacker can install whatever they want. These are, it's a drive-by download is what it's called. These things... That you just really need to not forget about it. It's something on a larger network that we process out. We make sure that uh, there is, there's systems and reporting in place to make sure that there isn't anything hidden in the back corner. Backup. Kenton touched on this. Um, I thought it was time. I thought it just fit. <laughs> we all, but everybody needs to back up their data. And it's not just ransomware. It's hardware failure. It's your theft. So uh, I, I can't tell you how many times in my career I've gotten a phone call from someone who went to a sporting event and came back out with their laptop missing from their car. It, it, it happens more frequently than you think. And if you didn't have your data backed up, that's gone. And there is a, there's a security exposure. So if you have something that's really private, uh, you have your there's a whole bunch of liability that can be attached to that. Surveys say that 42% of ransomware victims were, only 42% of ransomware victims were able to get their data from their backups. That is a sobering statistic. Um, and in that same survey, they're saying that only 75% of ransomware, uh, of people who, had, who got their data were able to get 100% of their data. So most people, who are infected don't get all of their data back. They only get a small subsection, and you hope for the right subsection. So the point here is you're only as good as your last backup. Uh, if anybody's a Big Bang Theory, Schrodinger's cat, it's the Schrodinger's backup. Uh, but really, you're only as good as your last tested backup. Another thing from history in this industry is I can't tell you how many times I have gone to a backup to only find out that it doesn't exist. So the backup software ran, it's been running perfectly, and nobody's either, either nobody's seen the errors or nobody's tested. It said that it worked, but it, it really doesn't, and you're, what you thought was there isn't there. And on third thought, you're only as good as your ba secured, tested backup. The issue is that ransomware when most vulnerabilities, when they get on your system, they're searching for data. 
they're, they're looking at your C drive, they're looking if you have any thumb drives installed, they're looking across the network for anything that it have ac has access to and can encrypt. So if your backup is on a thumb drive or on a USB drive and it can access it, it will encrypt it. Uh, and I, I know that because I, I dealt with a customer who had their backup drive attached. Uh, it, was a, they were, it was a small backup, thumb drive, and it was attached when they got infected and they were unable to get their data because it was, so it was, well, encrypted. <laughs> no other way. And then the last part when we talk about backup is in larger networks is your users can and probably will store data that you don't know about. So if you're responsible for your IT, chances are someone's got their data on their desktop or in their My Documents or in Dropbox, OneDrive, any other one that I'm, we can just Google web storage, there's 100 in the first page. Your data is there, and I'm going to say if it's not, it needs to be backed up at some level, and you, a, a totally separate soft, a topic is you really need to know about it. Uh, if we're talking about risk assessment, this is one of the things that I talk about when I talk to people about risk assessment is do you know where your data is? And if, because if that person went missing or if that laptop went missing, are you okay? Bottom line, whether it's the cloud, a USB hard drive, a pen and paper, well, I don't think anybody has these anymore, but <laughs> it, was, it was a nice image. Uh, <laughs> you need to back up your data. And when you're, when you're choosing a backup strategy, it's about the length of time you're willing and able to lose data. So for some reason, for some reason, for some people, that means backing up some data once a month. Some people that means backing up once a day, and some people that means backing up several times a day. The question you need to ask yourself when you're, when you're looking at backup and someone's talking to you is saying, if I lost this much work time, can I move on? So for some people, if I lost a week and we have all the paper documents and it would probably, a week of data re-entry is you know, half a day for somebody in my office, maybe that's acceptable. But I know there's places where four hours is unrecoverable. So it's really about how much data can you lose. And if you haven't gotten it from here, backup is, pro is your last resort. It really is. It's, I know of, luckily I know of more customers who have been infected with something such as ransomware and been back up and running within, within hours or a day or two from their backups than I do of customers who have had to pay a ransom to get data. So this is, this is the spot because the nothing we do ahead of here is going to be 100%. There is, there's a chance. And because, and the reason that there's a chance is that we need to make sure that our users have some security awareness. Making sure that everybody understands what a good email is and a bad email and when to open an attachment, when to not. These, no, no matter how good your spam filter is, uh, no matter how good your, your security practices are, someone, these messages are going to get to someone's inbox. They are. They, these guys, they employ, they legitimately employ people to write these spam messages and distribute them. So, if you you just look at them, and they we they used to be unintelligible. Like you think about spam five years ago, it was unintelligible. Like it didn't you could oh yeah that's absolutely not right. That no Nigerian prince who spells <laughs> things wrong he spells prince wrong <laughs> is needing my money. But now they're getting it, they're stealing the images from UPS. They are stealing half the links, the the header, the the footer. And it looks real, and the only thing that doesn't is the link or the file that you may or may not be expecting. So uh, the two things, we'll, we'll, we'll come to the two things yet. Uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna talk, just the small quick tips. I talk about email. You know, if, if you spend some time with your users and yourself and think about the things that we click on in an email, so making sure that the header is right, making sure that the from address. So 
if an email comes to you from UPS, but the from address is something random, it, it's not UPS, I promise. Uh, a, good, a good practice is not clicking on links in an email. So if you need to go look up a tracking number and you're not 100% sure, go to UPS's website. They've got, they've got the tracking information. You just go to the tracking site. Do it manually. Don't, don't take the extra step from here. Clicking on display ads, it's another spot. Malver malvertising is the, is the coin term for that. Um, and if you get a, if you get a pop-up that says you have a virus uh, and you need to call a toll-free number, don't, don't call the toll-free number. It's, you're, you're just calling them from your number. Yesterday. No. <laughs> yeah, yesterday. Wow. Exactly. Like, because one of the things uh, Dave touched on, and so did Kenton, is these guys are intelligent. So they're going to take any information they can gather from you. So if you call them, they'll absolutely do a reverse lookup. If I, most, most of the research that I'm looking at, between 30 and 50% of ransomware infections expropriate data. So they take data from you to get their information. So more than their key. So we're talking about maybe it's your IP address, maybe it's your email address, maybe it's the server file. What they're looking for is information. And they're looking for leverage to figure out what you're willing to pay. Because they know grandma's not paying $10,000, but they do, but if they figure out how large you are, and most of that stuff's on the internet, they're going to figure out what you probably will pay if you have to. So just keeping, keeping an idea of, of that, if, if you have to pay something, keeping some anonymity is a level. It's not going to, if you're anonymous, they may still know about you, but best not give them any information that you don't need. So as I close out, where do we go from here? In case your eyes glazed over as I started, <laughs> Dave, uh, <laughs> basic action points. Increase your security awareness. Make sure that at some level you're talking to your users about phishing, about good password policies, about just good practices. Identify and implement basic security measures. So that's the spam, the firewall, the antivirus. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, find an IT vendor who does. Uh, there's lots of great guys, and there's lots of great information on the internet who will sort that out for you and give you an understanding of what it is. But don't go without. Building a business continuity plan. Uh, and that's backup. That's a response plan to what happens if I'm infected. For, for an organization like Grandy, that response plan is probably pages, many pages long, and has lots and lots of steps. What's that? 67, 67 pages. <laughs> I knew you would know that. I just edited it a month ago. So. <laughs> uh, but for a small organization, it might be a paragraph. But the things inside there is, what would you do if you come in to work tomorrow and your accounting data isn't there, or your customer files aren't there, or what you need to, for your people to do what they do isn't there, what would you do? Where are those backups? Who would you call? How long would it take? Because this, the second part of the sobering statistic is that only 56% of organizations who have internal IT from this study had any response plan. That's, like these, these, are, these are people who should know better. So learn from their mistakes is what I'm thinking. The last piece, the last two spots here, they're add-ons, combat ransomware. Your best defense is a full and complete backup. I know I hit that. I'm going to keep on talking about it. I talk to, I talk to everybody about this. Make sure that your backup is right. I'm going to say with customers that we manage their entire network, our best practice is bare minimum monthly, we are doing test restores. Consider reviewing or talking to somebody who knows how to set up a Bitcoin wallet. Or working with an organization who has one set up, who knows how it works. It's not setting up a bank account. And it takes time and 
If you need to do it really fast, it takes an additional percentage to buying it. And if you need to do it really, really fast, it means that it's more money and you're going to, well, there are 12 Bitcoin ATMs in Winnipeg when I Googled it. And some of them are not in the nicest areas. Like it's just, it, I, I assisted a, one of our guys assisted a customer to go and buy their data and we had to go to a Bitcoin ATM at 10 o'clock at night to, you know, it just, it's things you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to learn under duress because it just needs to, it should be a little more planned out because these, these things cost money and they cost time and they allow for mistakes. And then just a side piece is consider purchasing some cyber insurance. I'm not an insurance salesman. Uh, but just look, look at your risk, look at, and, and talk, to, talk to somebody who is, and the, the big deal is look for a solid policy that has some appropriate limits for your organization and someone who has some claims experience. So if, they, if they've never sold it before, you probably should find somebody who has sold it, be my recommendation. So at this point, this is what I had prepared technically. Um, questions is where we're at. I know some of our food's coming out. Um, what kind of questions do you want? <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you got? Maybe before we start on the questions, oh. I just wanted to say uh, one more thank you to Winkler and District Chamber of Commerce for allowing us to uh, provide this free information. Um, also wanted to thank Kenton from GTP for his input, very valuable. And uh, we are available for questions. I also wanted to encourage you to please fill out the survey forms that are on the tables. Uh, that will help us to uh, adjust the information that we provide for the next time. So thank you very much. Tanya? Thank you guys. You guys pulled this off in a very short amount of time. And uh, it's great that together with these partnerships, we can hit really valuable topics that are essential for our business community to know. So thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for coming. I do also have a question, Sure. Um, if I can move on to that. Yeah. I'm wondering about an annual security audit for a business. Is that a thing or is that something that, because uh, for myself at the Chamber, I know nothing about this type of thing. I just kind of hope that we, you know, that we're on top of it as much as we can be based on the knowledge that we have. But is there such a thing as an annual security audit for a business? Absolutely. Yes. There's, uh, there's a couple different levels of what, like, all right, so this, this goes into, I was very purposeful. This is what I do for a living, if you hadn't figured that out, <laughs> the whole arm thing. Uh, but this kind of falls into some of the things that we do. So with some, with some organizations, we'll do it annually. We'll work with them and audit where the systems are and move them forward. There's, no one is going to be, like, the only surefire is to take your computer, turn it off, and put it into a closet. There it won't get infected. So it's just about risk mitigation. Mm -hmm. And these things cost money to do. So we just walk in through where, what's your risk and what's the cost to mitigate it, and then we just do that annually and make sure that things move forward and you get sorted out. So there's that, and then we do some point in time stuff as well for, for organizations that have some, either they have internal IT or they have some people who are savvy. So we'll just be, I've done this quite a few times, I'll come in and we'll just talk about what industry best practices are, and then put them on into a, a bit of a path so that they can start building their and making things a little bit more secure. You got something? Yeah, sure. Perfect. Come on down. Um, if you wanted to get started on building a business continuity plan, how do you start that conversation with your boss? How do you kind of, how do you just uh, kind of sit down and start that meeting, you know? I think the first thing, uh, we, we have intent, we're, we are videotaping this so that we, our intent is to put it onto YouTube and make just it available. So show them that first, or her, show them that first. And uh, send them the scary part of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, probably the, the right way is, it is generally when I'm talking to people about it, I'm talking about risk versus mitigation. So what, are we comfortable with the risk that we have? Your, your chances of being infected with ransomware is far greater than the chances of your building getting wiped out by a tornado in Winkler. Totally possible or 
a massive flood, like these things happen, but less frequently. And when they're on the news, it's one big news thing and we all forget about it. If there isn't a, already a business continuity or disaster recovery plan in place, IT is a great place to start because as Kurt said, it's very tangible, it's very real. A lot of what you do to develop those plans on the IT side are directly translatable into every other aspect of the business. Uh, I just recently went through it in the last few months with one of my clients uh, and looked at what they had in place for a, a business continuity and disaster recovery plan and basically updated it, uh, helped them to update it, but noticed a lot of the parallels that there are with if your IT isn't working, your business isn't working. So therefore, it helps in the grand scheme of things as well. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, if uh, my backup software backs up onto an NES and that's, encry that's an encrypted backup, yep. does that protect it from ransomware? Some. Now, it all depends on how and so your, 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 your network attached storage, that's what NAS stands for. It's a, it's a hard drive on the network just so we get everybody uh, that you copy to. If it's encrypted in an off state, so there's different ways to encrypt things. I'm going to get really, try not to get super technical. So maybe is the answer, is the real answer. Because if your server can access the NAS without any other protocols, any usernames and passwords, it's, to, it's just a drive letter, it is at risk if the server is, at, is infected. Now, one of the best practices in this is to make sure that it, there's only communication between your backup device and your server and not all of your workstations and your server so that if someone in the reception gets infected, it can't search the network and find the NAS, which although is encrypted when you turn it on, you have to put in its password and now it's open and has, a, has, has access. Or NAS, uh, the, only the server accesses the NAS. Yeah, so that's kind of the, it maybe is the right answer and you're going down the right path. Mm -hmm. But again, you, this is a rabbit hole. You can keep on digging, it'll, it'll go forever. So I'd be happy to, to talk about exactly the, the, this, the real risk, but mm -hmm. we'd have to, look at exactly how it's configured. But it does give you an added layer of protection. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, to not only ransomware, or, uh, but also physical theft. So if, you, if somebody kicked in the door and took the box, at least that wouldn't be something that is readable directly. Public Wi-Fi is a... <laughs> it's a danger, all, every time. So the primary reason that public Wi-Fi is a danger is that you don't control where the data is coming from. You, someone has put up an access point and you have no control of how they're getting your data from your computer to the internet and back. And it would be, the, probably my, my largest concern is something that would be called a man in the middle attack. So basically they take all of your data in the middle and they just record it. Some, somebody's tapped the line. And that's where they can steal login information and basically they get to see what's going on. So if you are gonna use uh, top researchers that I'm reading about, and Randy might chirp over there, I'm hoping not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, t top researchers would say don't use it. Use, your, uh, use a, uh, like a hotspot that you control. So, but if you are going to, there is, the, the, the things that I would be looking at is no HTTP access, so don't go browsing HTTP websites. That, uh, unless you don't care about the data. Don't put your data in an unsecure website. So HTTPS, so your banking, Google, that sort of thing, they're all HTTPS. It's secured, so that's a layer of protection. It's not foolproof. Making sure that your firewall is on, and don't access any proprietary company data that you're not absolutely willing to have. At. Like if, you, if somebody else read what you're looking at and you would be in legal trouble or business jeopardy, you shouldn't be doing it on public Wi-Fi without a, an additional layer of security like VPN, but even there it's, it's dicey. So there is, an, there is an attack that has a pop-up in a website that tells you your computer's not up to date. That's 99.9% .9 of the time not legitimate. I'm talking about 
the legitimate ones, so iTunes popping up in the bottom saying that you need to update or when you open it. Windows updates saying, hey, creators updates, you might as well go for coffee while I update your computer. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the Java update, the, these things, just making sure that the applications you use aren't stale dated. So you know, not using Windows XP. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, making sure that these things are, are covered up. And if you're not sure, it's, it's the same concept that we were talking about on, on one of the slides. If you're not sure if a pop-up's legit, go actually into your Windows and do the update from there. Yep. That's the best way. Go the long way around usually is a, we'll, we'll take a lot of these. It, it'll answer the question most of the time. Yep. Most of these infections, what they like to do is go in the background and they'll just sit there and encrypt your data, let you use your computer you don't know. Because it wants to get as much data as it possibly can before it lets you know that they've got you. Uh, and the, the usual indicator, when, when someone's infected, usually the indicator is someone either is opening a file that is not right anymore, or someone is complaining about their computer being like extra, extra, extra slow. Because someone, there is a computer on the network burning their CPU trying to encrypt those files, because that is a, it's just a mathematical calculation. And then when it's all done that, it'll, it usually prompts you. A lot of the time what happens is your computer's really slow and you reboot it because that's what we do. And then it notices the, a lot of them at least in, that I've seen have noticed, oh, it rebooted, he probably knows. So then it flashes the screen and says, it keeps on encrypting in the background. So it could be a couple hours, it could be usually within 24-ish is what I've seen. But if you have lots of data, it could go a long time if nobody notices it. If you're infected, unplug your computer from the network, first of all. And uh, I would probably, most times on a workstation, I'd be pulling the power. Because <coughs> often if it hasn't completed, then you can at least go and everything that isn't done, it hasn't been infected, can be recovered. You can just copy it off because it isn't been, hasn't been encrypted yet. On a server, you don't want to just pull the power. <coughs> you need to find, find, but pull it from the network and find somebody really, really quickly to help you figure out if, if you're not comfortable figuring out where the, which app, because it's going to be, in those instances, we're looking for the, the actual executable that's running on the server to stop and then let us go back. In worst cases, we'll shut it off and we'll access the data from another machine, but some infrastructure doesn't let it. But once you're infected, the only two options you really have is restore, from, restore your, your infected files from a backup or pay the ransom. There is, I will say, there is a, there's, a, there's an asterisk on pay the ransom. Uh, the fact that some older variants and more simple variants of ransomware do have publicly accessible decryption keys. So there is, we have run into that as well, where somebody gets encrypted with a, a little bit of an older version and there are some of the researchers who have published the decryption key. So we just drop it in and they give you the calculation, you can encrypt your file, decrypt your files for free. So that is a asterisk, but it is by far the minority. Yeah, and it does still take time too, because uh, depending on when you catch it, if you have terabytes of data and most well, of it's been encrypted, the, it's going to take time to decrypt even if the key is available. I recommend looking at it. So it really depends on your risk. So I can tell you that I have it, uh, but it's also like majority of the business and there's liability that when I, when I help people that adds to the risk for me. But I'm saying have the conversation with somebody who does that for a, like who sells insurance and is the policy ha handler because it's something to really think about. I, that's my recommendation is make sure you think about it because th it's a risk versus reward, right? Yeah, you know how much insurance is too much. Like this, this is a lot more. This is an awesome attendance because it's so topical. You know, you have the city of Atlanta, Boeing, Tim Hortons. Like these are not these are not small organizations with no IT budget. They are very large with very big IT budgets. And these guys, they have people who think about this and they're still, they're still an attack vector that, that they get compromised with. So uh, 
that doesn't mean that we shouldn't look at it, but it means that, that that's why our insurance companies are starting to add these in as riders. And Do you guys offer a testing service to see who's vulnerable to uh, click on the phishing email? Yes, uh, to both questions. Okay. Um, one of the things that we are uh, doing right now is uh, if anyone is interested in learning more about it or just sitting down having a 20 minute, half hour conversation with somebody like Kurt, uh, that is something that we offer. And then we can provide next steps, you know, do you want us to come in and do an evaluation as such. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely something that we provide. Um, thank you for asking that. And uh, so, yes, uh, the answer is yes. Do I, it's, not a, it's not a specific package, and because yeah. everybody's a little bit of a different size, and everybody has a bit of a different focus on what, what, what are they concerned about. So a lot of what I cover when I, talk, when I sit down with somebody is the same, because the foundation of security is the mm -hmm. same, regardless of your size and your interest. Mm -hmm. But the things that we, the next steps from a conversation like that, the reason I do these consultations is so that we can figure out what you're, what, what are we looking for? Are we looking for some, some best practices? Are we looking for, to figure out a gap analysis? Are we looking for some user education? We do all those things. If no one else has any questions, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thanks yes. for coming out and spending thank your you lunch hour with us. Yeah.